<clears throat> so, uh, you've had a bit of a brief respite from me over the last couple of weeks, um, which I'm sure you've found very hard to, to take. I'm sure that it's been very difficult, not having me up here bumping my gums, but hey, there you go, what can I say? You've missed me, haven't you, Hannah? Yeah, she says, right answer, good girl. Right, anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to plan to continue to look at this little parable uh, of Jesus, which is the unshrunk cloth and new wine. So this is uh, 1.2, which means we've had 1.0, 1.1, and we want 1.2. So this is the third message in the series on this particular little parable. And um, just give you a heads up, I will wrap it up today. So you can breathe a sigh. Yeah, that's it. Azari is fist pumping at the back there. He's going, yeah, thank goodness for that. Uh, get that one done and out of the way. with. And so it does mean that we'll be able to track on to the next one in the 36, 37, 38 parables that we've got to work our way through. We're on track for another seven years, I think. So uh, we should be good. Um, so this is a little dual parable. It's a dual parable. So we've actually got a Brucey bonus here. You've got two in one. You know, so you, we've actually not killed two birds with one stone with this parable. Um, the unshrunk cloth and the new wine. And for those of you that re- might actually remember this, this is found in the um, uh, synoptic gospels. Yeah, Matthew, Mark and Luke. We know what the synoptic gospels are. Um, of course we do. And last time we took a look, we actually dealt with the point that Jesus made regarding the unshrunk cloth. So we started off looking at the unshrunk cloth and, and how that perhaps holds a deeper and particularly more culturally and contextually significant meaning uh, than we may first have imagined. So, uh, to recap then, we're going to quickly read through uh, each of the Gospel accounts to give us a reminder and get us back into the swing of it uh, and find out which one, what, what, what these two little parables are all about. So, kicking off with Matthew. Matthew 9, 16 to 17. It says this, No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skin, and so both are preserved. And then we looked at Mark 2, 21 to 22. So no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. And then we looked at Luke, Luke 5, 36 to 39. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does... The new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skin and no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says the old is good. Luke's account is slightly different and um, I'm not going to go into some of the stuff that Luke talks about, uh, particularly verse 39, saying old wine desires new for he says the old is good. I'm not touching on that. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, And I don't plan to give a sort of detailed refresh on the preamble to this parable, because basically Jesus was using a a wedding illustration prior to setting up this parable. He was talking about a Jewish wedding. And in doing so, we've unpacked all of that. In doing so, he made a statement that basically said he had come to unite with Israel his bride as her bridegroom, her Messiah, and her God. This is the statement that he made previous, prior to actually working into these parables. So he stood there in the place of God as the bridegroom, and his disciples were the ones who were responsible for getting it all organised, getting this wedding ceremony all organised. It wasn't the temple, it wasn't the Pharisees, it wasn't the Sadducees, it wasn't the scribes, it wasn't any of these other religious leaders. It was this ragtag bunch of people called the disciples Fishermen, tax collectors, and all the rest of it, they were the ones that Jesus had said, they're, they're, that's my crew. They're going to get all of this sorted out for me as I come and present myself to my bride, Israel. 
which is significant. And the language in the Greek also implies that the bridegroom is going to be taken away by force, violently, and the bridegroom would be lifted up, that the bridegroom would be elevated, that the bridegroom would be elevated above the ground in order to carry something that has been borne up. This is all in the language. And this links to a Hebraism meaning to expiate, to expiate, to forgive, absolve or atone for sin. This all links in. So the imagery that Jesus says, I'm the bridegroom, but by the way, before any of these nuptials happen, I'm going to be snatched away. I'm going to be raised up and I'm going to be put up somewhere above the ground. I'm going to be elevated in order to absolve sin. That's quite impressive. That's quite impressive. So before we get to this parable, he has said, I have come to unite with Israel, my bride. I am her bridegroom, her Messiah, her God. These are my disciples who are going to get all of this organised. But there will come a time when I am taken by force, I am lifted up, I am elevated above the ground in order to carry, to bear and to expiate sin. That's quite something that he said before he's gone into these parables. Now to understand that, we've had to unpack that. But the Jewish people listening to it would have gone, yeah, okay, you've got my ear now, I'm listening. I'm interested. So we often miss this. We miss this because too often what we do is we we skim the surface of a story. We just skim the surface. And what we're not prepared to do is like those gannets up there. We're not prepared to dive deep. We've got to dive deep and we've got to pull up that treasure. We've got to pull up all of that rich stuff which is below the surface. Don't just skim the surface of this book that we have. Dive into it. Dive into it funny isn't it It, we we spend all of our lives striving striving for riches and yet the the repository where the greatest riches lie that book that bible that some of you have open in front of you we don't exercise our muscles to dig into you occasionally take it off the shelf blow a bit of dust off it And I think that every single one of us one day is actually going to be brought to task about that. That one day in the future, we're going to be brought to task about that. And one day God will say to us, what did you actually do with the treasure that I gave you? This is treasure. What do you do with it? What have you done with it? What have you done with it? At the beginning of this year, I set you all a challenge. What was it? Read through the Bible in the year. Read through the whole Bible in the year. We're 11 months in. How are we doing on that? I don't want anybody to answer. Please don't answer. I set the challenge in January. We're 11 months in. How are we doing on it? Treasure. Treasure. Treasure is at our fingertips, yet it's never brought up to the surface so that it can really benefit our lives. We're a funny old bunch, aren't we? We really are a funny old bunch. We're a right mixed bag, which is good because God deals with mixed bags, which is great. Everybody he seems to recruit is a mixed bag. You know? According to the gospel accounts, there was a whole mixed bag in Jesus' audience. Three distinct groups that were in play as he spoke these parables. Three distinct groups are actually identified. In Matthew, you've got John the Baptist's disciples. The baptizer's disciples came to Jesus. In Mark, um, people saw that John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And so it was a bunch of people. We don't know who the people were. It's just people. People came to Jesus. In Luke, it was the Pharisees. It was the Pharisees and the scribes. They came to Jesus. And they also gave him a little bit of a rock up about prayer as well. So each gospel has got this slightly different question recorded for us. There's a slightly different audience recorded for us. And so on top of all of that, we've also looked as we've tracked through this at the traditional church teaching around this parable. And in a sort of nutshell, the traditional church teaching around these two parables, the cloth and the wineskins, is that Judaism has now been replaced. That Christianity has preeminence. The old for the new. 
and it just fails to stack up. It fails to stack up in so many areas. Not least of all, not least of all, that the church was not in existence when Jesus was teaching. The church was not in existence. The church, ecclesia, the body of Christ, what we understand to be the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, was a mystery. It was a mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul by the risen, ascended Jesus, who now sits at the right hand of God. The church was a mystery, only revealed to Paul. And at the right hand of God, just a reminder about this, the right hand of God means the one who has the power and the authority of God on earth. It is not a position to the right of God. Don't think form, what it looks like. Think function, what it does. Think function, what it does. If you have the right hand of, if you are at the right hand of the king, you speak for the king. You have the power and the authority of the king. That's what it means. It's a, it's a function thing. It's not a form thing. Another thing that we need to keep in mind as we are tracking through this is ecclesia, what we call church, changes according to the context. It can mean assembly, it can mean congregation, it can mean gathering, it can mean comes, those who come to homes, um, at, at, come out of their homes and into the public. It also includes what we would today call messianic Jews. Messianic Jews. It also includes Jews and Gentile believers in Jesus as the body of Christ. And even in uh, Acts, it was even used as a bunch of rioters in Ephesus. Ecclesia. So we've got to be careful about all of these things. And Jesus was speaking into a Jewish messianic context. And if we get that, if we really get that, then we're going to hopefully be able to understand the meaning of these parables in, in a much clearer fashion. And so that was our backdrop as we ended up in Matthew 9, 16, when we're talking about the, the piece of unshrunk cloth on the old garment. And as we track through it in Mark, and as we track through it in Luke, and we have that backdrop leading us into those pieces. And so those verses that I put up there, this is where the, the view comes from that Jesus was introducing a, a sort of new, vibrant replacement for this crusty, old, flawed and failed uh, Judaism of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. This is where we've sort of drawn this view from in the church teaching. And it's simply not true. It is simply not true true at first glance this parable appears to support the traditional church teaching that jesus couldn't patch this new ministry of his into the old threadbare perishing cloth of judaism and so rather than attempt to patch it up his ministry would terminate judaism judaism had now served its purpose and jesus would usher in this new order so, the church age is now upon us. The garment of Judaism just now needs to be thrown out. We no longer have a need for Israel in the purposes of God. And the church is now the recipient of all of the promises that were made to Israel. This is, this is where we get the teaching that comes through, which we call replacement theology. Replacement theology. And replacement theology runs rampant through many evangelical churches today. Runs rampant. I noted earlier that we need to always remember, whenever we read the Gospels, particularly when we read the Gospels, Jesus was teaching in a Jewish context. In a Jewish context. Everything we look at and read needs to be understood through that lens. So the fact, the very fact that the church wasn't even around at the time of Jesus' teaching, should shout pretty loud that absolutely none of what Jesus is teaching about in his parable speaks of the church. Because the church wasn't there. Even on that basis, we should be able to get it. It's got nothing to do with the church. Jesus was talking about Jews. Jesus was talking about a Jewish system of belief. And so I asked you when we looked at these parables to actually start to think about these parables not as replacement, but as of restoration and resizing. Restoration and resizing, or sizing to fit. Because the new thing that will be offered 
will restore Israel and it will restore the Jewish people. And it will enable the Gentiles to be grafted in to a strong, deeply rooted system of belief that can draw on generations and generations and generations of strong teaching and examples of how God acts in his character and in his nature. And so these two parables, then, I said, are like flip sides of the same coin. They're flip sides of the same coin. We looked at the unshrunk cloth, and I called that one heads. And we identified that the, the patch of unshrunk cloth is Jewish belief in Jesus as Messiah. We'd call that Messianic Judaism, yeah? Jews who believe that Jesus is Messiah. Today we call those Messianic Jews. And the old garment is traditionally structured Judaism. So traditionally structured Judaism, Messianic Judaism. This is what we're looking at here in these parables. And the unshrunk cloth, Messianic Judaism, needs to be adapted, i.e. it needs to be shrunk, it needs to change, it needs to adapt. Um, this whole unshrunk thing is just an analogy for adaption. It doesn't mean made smaller, it doesn't mean um, diminished in any way, it means adapt. The cloth needs to be adapted. And the conclusion that I offer to you was that Jesus was making the point that Messianic Judaism, belief in Jesus as Messiah, needs to adapt in order to tap into this hugely strong root system of Judaism. It needs to draw up all the goodness of the root system in order to strengthen it. This amazing little patch isn't here to replace, it's here to preserve the old garment. It's not here to replace the old garment, it preserves the old garment for future use. Jesus doesn't say you throw away the old garment, does he? You patch the old garment. If you patch your old jeans, what are you planning to do? Continue to use them, are you not? If you put a patch over a piece of clothing, you're not patching it to throw it away, are you? You're patching it for it to continue using it. Well, that's what I do. I used to have a pair of jeans once which had holes everywhere, and my wife patched them up. I mean, we had, like, significant patches everywhere on my jeans because I wanted to use them. They had more purpose. It was all about function. And this function for the Jewish people is still waiting to be played out in all its fullness. And so Messianic Judaism would preserve the garment of traditionally structured Judaism so that the purpose can be played out for the future. So Jesus makes that point on the head side of the coin. And then what he does is he flips the coin over to make another point, which is a complementary point. So we're going to have a look at that and see how that stacks up. Matthew 9, 17. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins and so both are preserved. Mark 2, 22. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. Luke 5, 37, 39. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled. And the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Nice and simple. Nice and simple, eh? We've got it covered now. We can all go home. Yes. Early finish. Nice and simple. Ditch the old wine skins. They can't handle the new wine. We need something fresh for this new brew. Game over. Job's a good one. Just remember, Jesus is teaching. Just remember the context that Jesus is teaching into. He's speaking in terms of Jewish belief, and he's speaking in belief as himself as Messiah, and he's speaking about Messianic Judaism. And Messianic Judaism, when you look at what Jesus is, calls that, he calls that ecclesia, which we call the church. Jesus uses the same word, ecclesia. Ecclesia are those people who have a belief that Jesus is Messiah. That's what Jesus called them, not me. I'm not making that up. You can go and check that. Go check it out. When Jesus talks about the church, he's talking to Jewish people who believe in him as Messiah. Ecclesia. Same word that we use for the church. So, he's talking, in the, he's talking this parable in comparison to traditionally structured Judaism. He's making these comparisons. 
So if the head side of the coin was about showing how messianic Judaism has to adapt to fit the old garment, the flip side of the coin, tails, would indicate that traditionally structured Judaism needs to be flexible to receive messianic Judaism. Do you follow? And so perhaps this is the key to what Jesus is actually teaching. He's teaching flexibility. There must be accommodation on both sides of the coin in order to have the whole coin. It's about accommodation, flexibility. So we've looked at heads and we've identified the the patch of unshrunken cloth as Jewish belief in Jesus as Messiah, Messianic Judaism. The old garment, traditionally structured Judaism. Now we flip the coin and where we've got tails, where we've got new wine, which is Jewish belief in Jesus as Messiah, Messianic Judaism, and we've got old wineskins. What do you think that is? Traditionally structured Judaism. So we've got the two things. We've got the comparisons. You see, the, you see how it's working there? Do you see that this is just actually the flip side of one coin? Can you see that? Can you see what I'm putting out here? No, yes. I hope you can. Because if you understand this, if you can understand this, it's going to help get a better view of what Jesus was actually meaning when he was teaching So I'm going to make the point one more time. Maybe I'll make it more than that. This teaching is not about the church as we understand the church. This is not about the church. The church was not in existence. Unless you are referring to what Jesus called the church, ecclesia. Because that was well in existence. Because that was those Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah those people that we would call Messianic Jews. This is a Jewish context that Jesus is teaching into. This is not white, this is not Greek, this is not Gentile, this is not a Western European setting. This is ancient Near East Judaism. We need to understand that. And so if I've looked through this, I've, there's a number of little observations that have come out as I've worked through it. First one for me is Matthew and Luke comment that the wineskins are being destroyed and the wine's going to be spilled, Mark indicates that both wineskins and the wine are going to be destroyed. Why? Why is all the wine gone? It's outrageous. Why? Why the difference? And the other one was, what's the problem with putting new wine in old wineskins? You know, putting new wine in old wineskins, they're not immediately going to burst. They're only going to burst if they're kept in it. They're only going to burst if they're kept in it. So why not just drink it? Why not just drink it? And if it's got to be kept, what's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of that? And then, on that note, what do we actually mean by new? And what do we actually mean by fresh? So these are just some of the sort of questions that I was asking of the text as I was working through this. There's probably other questions that have come to my mind, but um, I don't have time to actually go into them all. So I'd like to finish this off today, like I said. So why the difference in Mark's gospel? Why does he mention that the wine will be ruined along with the skins? Mark's the only one that mentions that. Matthew and Luke say it's going to be spilled. They don't say it's going to be ruined. But Mark says it's going to be ruined. So, do you want to know the answer? Yes? Short answer is I don't know. I don't know. I have a suspicion. My suspicion is that it has something to do with the audiences that Jesus is addressing in his particular parables. Because the audiences are are representative in some way of, as containers of this messianic faith. While the wineskins represent traditionally structured Judaism, they perhaps also represent a particular type of structured Judaism that would give rise to the faith in Jesus. Maybe a particular type. If there's no messenger... Think about who Jesus is addressing in these parables, the different audiences. If there is no messenger, John the Baptist. If there's no Judaism, scribes and Pharisees. 
If there's no Israel, the people, the three audiences, how can a faith in the Jewish Messiah of a nation called Israel be carried forward? It can't, can it? No messenger, no Jews, no Israel. How can we convey that message? It, it, it doesn't work, does it? It just does not work. Because there's no Jews, there's no Israel, there's no message. So you've got nothing to talk about at all. And this is, I believe, why there's so much focus today and throughout history on things like anti-Semitism and also the removal of Israel as a nation. You know, Hitler has got this really covered off well with his final solution. And the Arab nations appear to also have cottoned onto this in, in the way that they have a desire to see the physical nation of Israel removed from the map. Because, you see, on a cosmic scale, the Jews and their, their little tiny piece of real estate is absolutely crucial. And it's absolutely crucial to the return of Jesus. Crucial to the return of Jesus. You know, we here in our church, we can shout all we want about Jesus returning. We can pray for Jesus to come back. We can pray, Maranatha, Lord. Come back now, Lord. But he won't come back on our petitions. He won't. We're given a really clear indicator of this. And Ross has actually already touched into this, so I'm really pleased about that. Ross has touched into this as he gave communion. We're given a clear indicator of this timing and of what this is all about. And who will call Jesus back when Jesus laments over Jerusalem prior to his crucifixion? Matthew 23, 39. He's crying over Jerusalem, the home of the Jews, the center of Israel. And he says, for I tell you, Jerusalem, Israel, Jews, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Jerusalem, Israel, Jews, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus will return when the nation of Israel petition him to step back into our time, space, dimension. And when Jesus does do that, guess what? He's not going to step back into Australia He's not going to step back into New Zealand. He's not going to step back into the UK. He's not going to step back into Canada. He's not going to step back into South Africa. He's going to step back into Israel, onto the Mount of Olives. You can read about that in Acts 1, 10 to 12. And so we've got all of these layers of meaning which are available for us to consider, and all of which support the teaching that Jesus was dealing with Jewish stuff. All Jewish stuff, not church stuff. And so one of my other observations was about the new wine, old wineskins. What's the problem with that? There isn't. There is no problem with that at all if you plan to drink the wine immediately. It's only during the fermenting process that anything new is going to expand and, and stretch and explode. So the new wine isn't for immediate drinking, is it? Because if it was for immediate drinking, Jesus would have said... Fill your boots, guys. But he doesn't. He says you've got to have new wineskins. So the wine that he's talking about isn't for immediate drinking. It's for storage. Must be for storage. Can I get... Uh, are you following me? Yeah. yeah? So the new wine's got to be, going to be stored. Because otherwise it could go into old wineskins, couldn't it? And you could just knock it back. So the new wine is going into new wineskins, so it must be for storage. Now... If new wine is kept for storage, when you take it out, is it new wine? No, it's old wine. It's old wine. It's old wine. No longer new wine. It's old wine. New wine skins for new wine is to accommodate the aging process, which means there is ultimately a purpose for the storage of the wine and the wineskin that contains it. And so when we understand wine to be messianic Judaism, and wineskins to be traditionally structured Judaism, and we look at the future of both the Jews and Israel, we can clearly understand why this all needs to be stored for a later date, because this is all key to future world events. Israel is key to future world events. The Jewish nation is key to future world events. 
Does the language support this? Yep, I think it does. The language in the Greek supports all of this. And so it goes to that question, what do we mean by new? What do we mean by fresh? So if I say to you new, what do you think of? Anything. New. What do you think of? Clothes. Clothes. New clothes. Do you think of something covered in cobwebs? No. Shiny, bright, new. Something that's not been had before. And if I say to you fresh, what do you think of? Festivals. Festivals. Do you think of stale? You don't think of stale, do you? You think of fresh. You think of fresh bread, yeah. So, new and fresh then, the way that our understanding it, is that right in terms of the biblical context that we're trying to understand? Is, is the way that we bring our view into the scripture, is that right? Let's take Matthew as that point of reference. Matthew 9, 17. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins. Some of your translations may have new wine is put into new wine skins. They're two different Greek words. So fresh is probably the better translation. So fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. So you take a quick look at the Greek. We've got new mentioned a couple of times, and we've got fresh, which I've said is sometimes translated as new. Different Greek words. So new is the Greek word neos. New. It means recently born. It means young. It means youthful. So a woman who gives birth has a neos baby, a recently born baby. It's something that hasn't had time to grow. It's something that hasn't had time to develop. So new here means new in respect to time. New in respect to immaturity. New in respect to a lack of development. So this new wine is not new as in brand spank sparkling. It's immature. It needs to develop. It needs to grow. And fresh in the Greek is kainos. Now, kainos can mean new, but it also means fresh or re renewed. Fresh or renewed, and it links to a quality of form. So rather than implying that the thing that it's linked to is so old and so far gone, it so, so has no purpose, it doesn't mean that. An old wineskin may well have lost the flexibility to stretch and to accommodate new wine, but an old wineskin can be of great purpose and value and can contain that developing new wine if the qualities that it has are renewed, if the qualities that it had are freshened up. So if the new wine, Messianic Judaism, is poured into old wineskins, traditional structured Judaism, and the religious shape around that Judaism doesn't adapt, then both wine and wineskin will be useless. And the faith, belief in Jesus, is lost. And Judaism is ruined. And if the old religious forms, traditionally structured Judaism, become freshly prepared, if they become kainos, if they are reconditioned to accommodate their Messiah, to accommodate Yeshua, then both the faith in Jesus and Judaism are preserved. Completely. Remember this is a teaching to Jews about Messiah and about their faith. He's not teaching about Christianity and he's not teaching about anything that we call the church. So within the Jewish time and setting, what Jesus is saying to the people that are listening to this parable, back then, in the day, in Jesus' time, in Jesus' setting, he's saying, there is only one vessel that can hold the new wine of messianic life. Only one vessel. And that is a prepared, renewed, restored, reconditioned and refreshed Judaism. At the time Jesus was speaking, I'm not talking about a time now, I'm talking about what the hearers would have heard. Jesus would have been saying the only thing that can accommodate belief in me as Messiah is a totally refreshed and reconditioned Judaism. There is nothing else in the world around. There is nothing else in the Roman Empire that can accommodate what I'm about to deliver 
only Judaism. The only Judaism if it adapts to accept me. The new wine needs to age. The old wineskin needs to refresh to accommodate. And that way both will be preserved and both will then be able to serve their purpose. Preserved in order to serve their purpose. I've told you what the purpose of Judaism is and of Israel. End times. They've got a purpose to play out in the world. And we read, don't we, in Matthew 16 about Jesus um, giving Peter the keys to unlock the kingdom. And we talk about this and that this is where the church would be built, etc., etc., etc. And the Roman Catholics, what's the symbol of the Roman Catholics? Any of you know? Yeah, and do you know what the symbol is for Catholicism? The, 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 two, the keys, the cross keys? Yeah? Keys to the kingdom of heaven? So the Catholics have the cross keys as their emblem. They have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Which is a great example, by the way, of Greek thinking. Greek thinking, Jesus says here are the keys, so immediately they picture keys. Mm, that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus wasn't giving them keys, physical keys, form. He was going, what does a key do? What does a key do? Unlocks. Jesus was saying to Peter, you will unlock the kingdom of heaven. Check it out in Acts. First in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the rest of the world. Who unlocks the Holy Spirit? Go on, I'll give you a clue. His name begins with P. Peter. Everywhere the Holy Spirit is unlocked through Acts in the very beginning. Jerusalem, Judea, the ends of the earth, Samaria, blah, blah, blah. Peter has the key. Peter prays, Holy Spirit falls. That's what Jesus was saying. You've got the keys, boy. You can unlock the kingdom of heaven. But, of course, the Greeks go, oh, keys. Oh, let's make keys. And now we can give them to the Pope. Now the Pope has the keys. Nonsense. It's function, not form. Matthew 16, 18, and this goes wrong as well. Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against this. And we stand up there and we go, yes, let's build that church. Yeah, amen, amen, let's build that church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. Was Jesus talking about the church? The body of Christ? Was Jesus talking about the body of Christ, the mystery that was revealed only to Paul by the risen, ascended Christ? No. Jesus was talking about ecclesia, and in Jesus' context, ecclesia was Jews who believed in him as Messiah. On this rock I will build my church, my people who believe in me as Messiah. It wasn't Christians. Christians hadn't been invented. It wasn't a Gentile church that hadn't been revealed, that hadn't even evolved. It was belief in Jesus as Messiah of Israel. On this rock, I will build my church. Jesus built it on the foundations of Jewish men, Jewish women, who believed in him as Messiah. We even get that from the, 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 the parable of the rock and the sand. You know, Luke is talking to the Gentile nations. The rock isn't revealed, is it? It's hidden. They have to dig for it, remember? But the rock to the Jewish nation was revealed. It's there. It's there. The Jews had got it all. That foundation, that, that deep, rich root system of the Tanakh, our Old Testament, the Gentiles, we've all been grafted into that. And despite the fact that the Jewish root system has been undermined, which is absolutely hugely ironic, considering that the whole of the Old Testament, the whole of the Tanakh, speaks of Jesus... Everything speaks of Jesus, and yet the church has managed to undermine all of that and replaced it by a counterfeit system that has managed to fuel much of traditional Christianity for the last 1,700 years. Counterfeit system. And despite the fact that much that is accepted as truth in the church, the body of Christ, Western church, Western church, despite the fact that much of that is actually counterfeit, the amazing thing is God is still at work in it. God continues to use it. God continues to use the church despite its failings, despite the people who are in it and who have been in it throughout the ages who have flawed and failed. And he's gracious. And you know what? He's going to continue to draw folk to himself, even if it is through a system that's become counterfeit. 
Judaism did not die with the coming of Jesus, nor was it ever meant to. Judaism is still a valid vessel for God's purposes. God has not finished with the Jewish people, he's not finished with Israel, and they are still the holders of covenant promises. So, wrap this up. If the unshrunk cloth doesn't adapt to the old garment, the cloth will tear away, and the tear left will be greater than before, indicating that faith in Jesus, if it isn't grounded in the root system of Judaism, is worthless, aside from the understanding of those truths found in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. If messianic belief seeks to detach from this, the void left in traditionally structured Judaism will be even greater than before. And if the new wine is poured into old wineskins and the religious shape around Judaism doesn't adapt, then both wine and wineskin will be useless. And the faith is lost. And Judaism is ruined. And if both the faith and Judaism are lost, the mechanism for calling for the return of Christ is also lost. There is a lot at stake. There is a lot at stake. So this gives us the coin. It gives us the heads. It gives us the tails. And I hope that it provides a better understanding of what Jesus was teaching when he was using these to illustrate his purposes. His message at the time was about restoration and sizing to fit. Restoration and sizing to fit. And that principle, and this is what we should be looking to pull from this, the principle that Jesus is teaching, that principle is of huge value for us to learn today in the church. Because at the end of it, we're reconciled. We've been sized to fit the body in order to be a valuable and a useful member of this community of faith. And it should sort of make us ask questions of ourselves. How do we actually accommodate that? How do we accommodate different moves within the church? How do we make room for God to move? Not necessarily throwing out tradition, but being willing to to flex, being willing to adapt, being willing to adjust in order to grow. I think we need to make sure that we, we hold and develop the necessary flexibility and the qualities of a teachable spirit. Each one of us needs to be teachable. No more so than the teacher needs to be teachable. But we all need to be teachable. And we all need to have a desire to want to learn. And dare I say it, even be challenged with our ideas. This book that we hold, you know, is absolutely riddled with new things that God wants us to grasp and understand. It's all within our reach. Every time I open it and I read it, there is something new in it. But there isn't, because it's been the same book that I've been reading for years. Nobody's come in overnight and added another little paragraph. But every time I open it and read it, there is something new in it. It is absolutely riddled with new things. It's all within our reach. What we need to do is to take hold of it and we need to be willing to dive into it. I hope that this has just opened up your minds a little bit. I hope that it's given you something to chew over and I hope it's added to some understanding. Understanding around his word. I hope it has. Next time around, what we plan to look at is the parable of the sower. Unless I've actually taught on that before and then we won't bother. But anyway, that's where we plan to go next. Let's just pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the clarity of your word if we view it through the correct lens. I pray that each one of us, Lord, would be more desiring to want to step into a closer, more intimate walk with you where we can really allow the beauty of your word just to wash over us And I pray that each one of us would be sensitive to the things that you're doing through the move of your spirit. May we discern what is of you and what is not of you. And I pray, Lord, that you just give us that wisdom to know the difference. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us would be teachable. 
Each one of us would be willing and wanting to learn. Quick to engage and slow to complain, Lord. Quick to engage, slow to complain. Your word is not difficult. Your message is not complicated. And forgive us for having made it so blooming convoluted, Lord, that Houdini would show would get out of it. I just thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes to your truth. And may your name be glorified. May your name be honoured now and for the generations. And in your Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.